Water and oil do not mix. They are said to be immiscible. They are opposites, and yet when they're mixed together, they still separate themselves and are clearly distinguishable. In my last video, Breaking Down a Stephen Furtick, I mentioned how I would love to preach in front of an audience like Elevation Church. I would love to preach to their crowd, because you could just say anything. This is an iPhone, and everybody's like, oh yeah, Pastor. And as I was reflecting about it, I was reminded of a time from about a decade ago where Matt Chandler actually got to preach at Elevation. Matt Chandler, reformed, Calvinist, clean cut, tucks in his shirt, wears a tie. Stephen Furtick, casual, charismatic, creative, frequenter of being on the Hype Beast page, preachers and sneakers, with a noticeable physical body transformation circa the year 2016. So what we're about to experience next is when water and oil mix in all of its glory. Bruce Lawn. This video is going to be a little bit different. We are jumping back in time to about a decade ago when Stephen Furtick was having a, I think it's called Code Orange Revival at his church. He had all types of different speakers and he had Matt Chandler come out and preach his message. Now this, there's some clips from this that you guys may have seen that were iconic. It's going to be I think very valuable because this may be one of the last times there were some folks in the mix that could push back and challenge a little bit and did Matt Chandler challenge a lot of it. All right. Now, what happened was about 11, 12 years ago, there was this, this, this really interesting series called The Elephant Room. The Elephant Room brought people together of different theological camps, so on and so forth. And I, I'm actually about to have one of the producers, directors of The Elephant Room on the channel. I don't want to give it away, but that's another reason you should be subscribed so you don't miss that. And they got these different folks together, and they had Stephen Furtick and Matt Chandler sit down and debate what seemed to be at the time more methodology, how they approach different things. And I'll be honest with you, at the time, I really liked... Stephen Furtick, I really liked his approach to being creative and wanting to reach people far from God and all of those different things. And there were some concerns that they had both kind of had for each other. And it was, I thought it was a really good, fruitful conversation that led to Stephen Furtick inviting him to speak at the Code Orange Revival. I'm 90% sure this has been scrubbed from their website. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play this thing. I'm, I'm probably going to get through most of it. I'm playing it a little faster, but man, is this internet gold. Like this, this thing is amazing. Okay. And again, we're going to be looking back at the elephant room more uh, in the coming weeks as I have one of the producers coming on. And uh, this, I think was a year after, I believe part one, it could have been after part two. I don't remember, but let's just jump in to be fair. I am not a Calvinist, okay? I do not align uh, with Matt Chandler on all theology. I liked what Elevation was doing at the time. I liked the idea of creativity and just doing different things and reaching people from God. So my views uh, more or less have remained the same, but I do think that this message is very, very timely. So we're going to react to it together, and I'm just going to start at the very beginning to let you guys just uh, experience uh, 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 a... a um, in my opinion, a more humble Stephen Furtick. All right, here we go. During the revival, we've been bringing out some auxiliary ameners just to help a preacher preach. Y'all go ahead and take your places. Come on, give it. So, what do you, first of all, I think it's amazing. They had people on stage who were, he, I think he called them auxiliary preachers. So, they were just there to kind of just hype up the preacher. Preaching isn't just. Shout out to Stephen Furtick on his physical transformation. I need to know, I need to meet your guy. Pastor Matt is, um, is kind of one of these. Wait a minute. Why they got these poor people sitting on crates? <laughs> Zach, you see that? Yo, <laughs> They're what? on orange crates. Why are they on orange crates, fam? It's, it's set design, Ruslan. It's code orange, crate orange. It's set design. It's got to be. <laughs> wow. Okay, let's keep watching. Who has a supernatural gift that just touches you in a way that when he speaks, you know God is speaking. And there's also this weird stage on top of the stage that I'm not quite sure what's happening there. I don't know if you can see that, Zach, but there's yeah, like a there's yeah. like a, a dance floor stage on top on top of the regular stage. So I'm not really sure what's happening here. Yeah, that's the uh, so those are the hype people, right? That are on stage. Yes, yes, those okay. are the auxiliary preachers, and, and they got crates so they could sit at the perfect height so the person behind them can be seen. Okay, I like it. I like it. It's the elevation experience. God gives different people a different voice. And one of my goals in bringing the Code Orange Revival together 
was to find a lot of different types of speakers, bring them all to our church and share them with the world so we could see that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that so you're telling me there's a chance? <laughs> one God who is over all and through all. We're known for what we're for. Can I tell them about the elephant room real quick? <laughs> we got invited. But, what, but, yo, but, but if Matt Chandler and Holly Furtick are not sitting on a crate, they got a nice cushy, uh, nice cushy orange chair. Uh, so, you know, shout out, shout out to the stage designer on this. Pastor Matt is uh, friends with a guy that I'm also friends with who's actually coming to our revival, Pastor James McDonald. He's coming to preach to us at the very end and make plans to be here. But he wanted to put an event together. You know what's sad about the elephant room? As fire of an idea that was, James McDonald, Perry Noble, and Mark Driscoll were all fired as pastors. And for different reasons, Rise and Fall Marcel, obviously, with Mark Driscoll. James McDonald had a similar type of situation. And Perry Noble, I guess, started uh, started drinking and his wife contacted the like, like, the Like, looking back at this in hindsight, like, I, I was watching this in real time because I was on staff at my church at the time. And again, Furtick, in this moment, I don't remember all of his theology, but like what, listening to him on an elephant room and then watching him a bit more than I have in the last decade uh, was was like a really solid or, or seemingly really solid communicator. Like he could really communicate. So it's just a bummer in hindsight that, you know, a lot of these folks uh, are, you know, aren't aren't like ha had suffered some some damage to their like reputation. The room, you know, the elephant in the room that nobody is talking about. Let's talk about it. Let's let's talk about it. So they made all these debate issues and they wanted me and. Chandler, they said, Furtick, you and Chandler are going to go at it. And they want us to line up on opposite sides of the ball and talk about an issue. Well, it, it was hard for me to understand how to get on the other side of the ball of a guy who's wearing the same jersey as me. Because, you know, we're both preaching Jesus. But then there was a funny part where this other guy who's uh, a mutual friend uh, named Pastor Mark Driscoll out in Seattle. He, he made a comment at one point. Yeah, he's great. But he made a comment at one point. He said, this is funny. He said, he read a list of preachers that I put on my blog, preachers I'm listening to this year. And he read the whole list and it was all kinds of different preachers, all kinds of different traditions. And he said that me saying I liked all those different kinds of preachers was like somebody saying, I'm a meat eating vegetarian. That's what Mark Driscoll said. Yo, Mark Driscoll was triv back in the day. He just say whatever he felt to your face at the time. So he's referencing, you know, everybody from TDJ, all these different people that 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 uh, Ferdick was recommending. And he says like being a, a meat eating meat eating vegetarian. Because these preachers don't go together. Well, I know there's false teachers out there and people who don't preach the gospel of Christ, but I wasn't quick enough on my feet to think of a response. Here's what I wish I would have said back to him. It's been about a year now and I got my comeback. You know how you always think of what you wish you would have said after you didn't say it. So I got my comeback. Here's what I would have said. I'm not a meat eating vegetarian. I'm an omnivore. I eat meat anywhere I can find it. I want meat. I want the word of God. Is anybody like me? You just, you want the meat of the word of God. So Driscoll, take that. But one of my goals was that we would have different kinds of preachers, all different streams of preachers, all different styles. You guys keep saying Furtick looks 19. His brother's 30 yet in this. Like he's he's late 20s, early 30s in this video. So that's that's you know great genes, I guess. Because it's not about a style. It's it's about a savior. It's about one sound. It's about one name. And so I hope that there's a sort of muscle confusion that happens to us spiritually as we hear all these great different. It's actually a really good metaphor. Mixing up the the the, the different styles and methodology to create muscle confusion in terms of your spiritual development again man this like the heart behind this stuff was 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 dope in my opinion in hindsight right uh, men of god who are sharing with us and women of god who are participating in our revival and i think what pastor matt helps me do the most is just to love god's word more deeply and be able to apply it in a way that is life-changing and soul rattling so you're blessed tonight and I pray that when God sends you a gift, you would receive it with enthusiasm. I want everybody at every location and watching all over the world to stand up on your feet right now and welcome to the stage, my friend, Pastor Matt Chandler. Come on, show him some good orange revival love. These dudes are polar opposites, fam. I mean, just to look, look at the way they're dressed, the demeanor, the body language. This is, this is, this is gonna be so good. I'm long-winded to begin with. Um, if you have your Bibles, we'll start simple, Psalm 23. If you've got a background in church, you have a coffee cup with that on it, but go ahead and, and open up uh, your Bible to uh, the 23rd Psalm. I'm, I'm glad to be here for so many reasons that it could be a sermon in and of itself, uh, but that's not what uh, I believe the Lord wants me uh, to share with you about. I've got to do some deconstruction with you, uh, and at certain points that might be... Yo, Matt Chandler was <laughs> Matt Chandler was early on a deconstruction wave. <laughs> but I promise you, uh, I'm here for your joy. I, I wouldn't have got on a plane. I wouldn't have left my beautiful babies. I, I wouldn't have... Uh, thought and prayed and fasted about whether or not even to be here if I didn't feel like I was supposed to come here for 
your joy. So I, I am not against your joy. I'm for your joy. But listen to me. I didn't say happiness. Because happiness and joy are not the same thing. You get that, right? All right because happiness can be taken from you in a second. Uh, everyone in this room has had a day that was unbelievably happy. The weather was perfect. It wasn't a night. You're standing out there trying not to die, all right? But, but ultimately, you've had a day. You've had a moment. You've had a season where there was this exponential amount of happiness in your life. But ultimately, you don't control happiness. I, I am not interested in boosting, encouraging, or helping your happiness because I believe it's cheap. And I believe it will not sustain you for the journey that God has you on. So what I am for and what I am after is your joy. And, and sometimes getting to joy stings. And so if some of this stings tonight, know that ultimately I come as an ambassador of Christ for your joy. And so with that said, uh, let's get to work. We, we have what a what an intro to an intro. I'm not here for your happiness. What a and, and that distinction between happiness, which, by the way, is the, the most it, highest form of success within, you know, I would say the world systems theology, be happy, be yourself, be your true self. If you be your true self, you'll be happy. And Matt Chandler out the rip says, Hey, there's a distinction between just being happy and being holy. I'm not here for your happiness. I'm here for your holiness. The, like that's a great, that's a great way to open up. So this is the intro to the intro. Uh, if we're going anywhere tonight, we've got to get to the bottom uh, of what's going on here. And so uh, I know some of you think that's more simple than others of you. Uh, some of you think, well, you know, challenge called Court Orange Revival. You're supposed to preach. We'll listen. We'll cheer you on. We'll clap. We'll sing some songs. And it'll be epic. All right. And, and but what I'm saying is we've got to get past even that. Like, here's what I'm saying. Uh, we've got to get past Code Orange Revival. We've got to get past Elevation Church. We've got to get past Pastor Furtick. I'm not saying those things are bad or wrong. I, I love all of those things. What I'm telling you is we've got to get underneath all of that so we can gaze upon what's actually going on. And so what we've got to look at not is uh, what's going on here, but really what is God doing and what is God about? Because if we can't get there, uh, then again, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be at a superficial plane that will not sustain you when it comes time for it to be your turn. Do you know what I mean by that? Your, your turn? And, and what I mean by your turn is you live long enough, you'll bleed. You live long enough, you'll experience loss. You you live long enough, your strength will... <laughs> He's an intense Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Got kind of this Greek, Romanian, Zeus-like picture where if you break the rules, you get lightning bolted. And, and that's kind of what they think about what God's doing. He's kind of Santa. He's look, making a list. He's checking it twice, and that's who he is. And then if you talk to um, a lot of evangelicals, their, their misconception is... Listen to this. So he's talking about the world's perception of God being more like Santa, be, keep having a list, you know, based on how good you are and be keeping rules. And then he says, here is the issue with evangelicals. Okay. And I would say not much has changed. If anything has gotten worse with evangelicals, listen to what he says as bad. And the misconception is that ultimately God is all about us and, and, and he's about me and the whole thing exists because of me. And so God was lonely in the beginning. And so what he did is he created me for fellowship because who wouldn't want to create a bunch of incompetent, non-loving, adulterous, idolatrous, disobedient children to call their own? <laughs> yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus is for you. Yes, Jesus is, is uh, providing for you. There's provision for you in the cross. There's love for you in those things. But ultimately, God's motivation in all of that isn't so you and him can be boys. <laughs> right, let, me, let me show you because I know some of you are like, I read your bio. You haven't been to seminary. I'm not buying it. So let's go. <laughs> Psalm 23, School of Mary. Let's go. Psalm 23, starting in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. And that sounds for me. He has this like little smirk on his face when he reads that. Oh, let's see if we can catch it. His, the Lord is my shepherd. And that sounds for me. Look at, look at him. Hello. That's amazing. Doesn't it? Sound like he's into me. He, he's going to bleed me the way. I mean, I don't know. I'm guessing there's not a lot of sheep herders in here. But, but, but ultimately, um, the, the shepherd watches over the sheep. Here's where we go to eat. Here's where we go to sleep. He's, he's, his job is to take care of the sheep. His job, in essence, is the sheep. That's his job. That's what he does. That's what he is uh, about. And so the Lord is my shepherd. So what's the Lord about? The Lord is about me. The Lord is for me. The Lord is after me. The Lord is watching over me. It's in the text. Now let's keep going. I shall not want. What a great gift that line is. Mm. I won't be in want. The, the deepest needs of my heart and my soul will be satisfied in my shepherd. Let's keep going. He makes me, I love that. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So you can lie down or you can be made to lie down. He leads me beside still waters. That's peace. He brings us into peace. And watch this. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness. So now this sounds like God is really into me. I mean, he's leading me beside still water. 
I mean, come on, who does that if they're not into you? <laughs> He's leading me in the paths of righteousness. But look at why. Look at the motivation in God's heart for all of this shepherding and reviving and restoring. He leads me in paths of righteousness for what reason? For his name's sake. So God's motivation behind his shepherding you, his provision for you, his love for you, his passion about you, really the motive in all of that isn't that you're great, it's that he's great. So the motivation is his glory, his name, his renown. And this is what you're going to see over and over and over again in the Bible in a way that God does not feel need uh, to apologize for. Let me, let me show you what I mean here. Um, uh, through all of this, I know this idea that God isn't about you, God is about God, kind of jostles our heart a little bit um, because everything in our culture actually is preaching the exact opposite. Everything in our culture is you deserve it and it's for you and, and this should happen. If it doesn't happen for you in this way, you have the right to be angry about that. And everything in our culture says you're the man. Everything in our culture is you are intrinsically valuable. You are, you are varsity. That's what you are. You're not JV. In fact, if someone tells you you're JV, all right, that's a slap in your spectacularly unique and beautiful face. It says that God created us for his glory. In Isaiah 49, that God called Israel for his glory. In Psalm 106, that God rescued Israel from Egypt for his glory. That God raised up Pharaoh to show his power and glorify his name. That's Romans 9, very unpopular chapter. God defeated Pharaoh at the Red Sea to show his glory. God spared Israel in the wilderness for the glory of his name. That's Ezekiel 20. God gave Israel victory in Canaan for the glory of his name. Why did he drive out that people? In fact, he tells Israel something we need to remember. He literally comes to Israel and goes, I'm not driving them out because you guys are awesome. You're a stiff-necked, rebellious people. I'm driving out because I'm awesome. Let me keep going. I could stop. I can't. I got time. I'm on a clicker here. I'm going through the Bible in a year right now, and that it really is the narrative of, of the scriptures. It's like God keeps making covenants with very flawed people and continues to do things for his glory. Like that, that is what it is. You, you can ignore that or you can read the scripture as it is. It's not uh, this fairy tale of where these good creatures who are doing everything. No, no, no. It's God consistently pressing in to very flawed people and establishing covenants with them for his glory. So just read through the, the entire Bible in a year. You, you'll see that fairly easy. Right? God gave Israel victory in Canaan for the glory of his name. That's 2 Samuel 7, 1 Samuel 12. God did not cast away his people for the glory of his name. Go ahead and tuck that one in. We'll come back, all right? He does not throw his people away for the glory of his name. We'll come back, all right? Um, in Ezekiel 36, God restored Israel from exile for the glory of his name. John 7, 18, Jesus sought the glory of his father in all that he did. In Matthew 5, 16 and 1 Peter 2, 12, we see that Jesus tells us to do good works for the glory of his name. Come on, right, I'll, I'll come on. on. Some of you are still skeptical. Okay. Um, in John 14, Jesus said that he answers prayer that God may be glorified. Yes. In John 12 and John 17, Jesus endures his final hours of suffering for the glory of God. All right. God instructs us honestly to do everything for the glory of God. Have you ever tried to, um, you ever tried to implement 1 Corinthians 10, 31? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. You ever thought about how to do that? Like, how do you eat breakfast to the glory of God? How do you uh, drive your car to the glory of God? How do you, I mean, this is the command. That's not a suggestion. Look, hey, guys, if you get a chance, try to do everything to glorify me. It's not, it's not a suggestion. Do everything for my glory. I, w I feel like this is laying the framework for a very basic theology, meaning that regardless on where you fall on the theological spectrum, regardless on if you're charismatic, Calvinist, whatever, God being consumed with his glory, doing it all for his glory, uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? Like he, God is about God's glory. That is why we worship God. Now, um, what you see in the Bible is this is from Genesis to Revelation, the, the story of the Bible, that God, for the glory of his name, is reconciling and reclaiming all things to himself. So this is what you've got to get. I want to try to help you here with something that's pretty big, pretty epic. All right, so look right at me. The Bible's not about you. <laughs> and that's the line. That's the line. The Bible is not about you. There's some people that go, this Bible's the roadmap to life. Now, I understand what they're saying, so if you've heard that from your guy, great. Uh, th this is, in some ways, uh, a roadmap of what we should do, where we should go, what, but, but ultimately, you can't call it the roadmap to life. All right, now, I want to be straight. There's some maps. <laughs> there are some maps, like right here, I've got... Basic instructions before leaving Earth, right? Uh, is that right? Or, you know what I mean? Like, what, is, is that the narrative? Is it a bunch of rules that you need to know? Or is there something much more, much bigger than that? Not the roadmap to life. And if you think that way, you'll read the Bible wrong. Uh, what you'll do is you'll keep, now let me, here's what you'll do. You'll keep infusing yourself into the stories of the Bible like you're the hero. 
This happens all the time. And this, friends, is what we call narcissus. Okay, we went over this before. Exegesis is just reading the scriptures and say, what, did, what is the scriptures trying to say here? And there's some parts, you get dicey with some stuff. You could disagree with some stuff. I mean, sit down, listen to William Lane Craig and James White debate Romans 9, right? Like, you, you could get dicey with stuff. And then, that, so that's, that's exegesis. Then there's eisegesis, where you are trying to then infer your own meaning into the scriptures. So if you're reading and you want to make a point about something, you go and try to find a verse and kind of contort it into meaning. It's kind of like the seeker-friendly crowd, right? Three-point topical sermons, you shout and infuse it. And by the way, I don't think topical sermons are bad. I mean, this is technically a topical sermon. And Jesus, though, is when you are then seeing yourself as the hero of every story. And he's saying Jesus is not how you should approach the scriptures. And he, and he goes on to explain why. Check this out. So, I, I mean, I want to be straight. I love you enough to be straight. You're not David. All right? Your trouble in life is not Goliath. And if that's true, you're in a lot of trouble, bro, because you miss. Uh, you fling your stones and you miss, and Goliath's still there, and now what? View the scriptures through that lens that really all the superheroes in the Bible are actually you, and then you put a weight on your shoulders that, listen to me, you will not be able to bear. Jesus, David, Jesus is the greater David. Jesus is the Come greater on. Moses. Jesus is the greater Abraham. It's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. Come on. The Jesus is the greater than. So, so if you want to do this, I mean, you want to dig in. So that means Jesus is going to be David. Goliath is going to be, and this is all overstatement. David's a historical figure, right? Um, Jesus is going to be David in this shadow. Goliath is going to be sin and death. Who's that make you? Uh, and it doesn't make you the Israelites in the corner going, he's going to kill all of us. That's exactly who you are. Read the entire narrative. There's a pattern of many messiahs Moses, David, so on and so forth. That and David and, and David is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Joseph being sold into slavery, right? Then rising to the it's a, it's a mini messiah foreshadowing Jesus. And so we always read and go, ah, well, you know, I I read the story of Jason, Joseph, and people thought Joseph was a, was was arrogant, and uh, Joseph had a dream. You gotta have a dream, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you probably would be the people that sold Joseph into slavery. Like, you probably would be the, the brothers that were just turned up on, on Joseph, right? So I think we got to be careful with, with this, this, like, always seeing yourself as the victor, and that's what he's getting at. And I talked about this on his channel, and still get feedback on it. It's okay to read David and see yourself. Hey, listen, if you see yourself in David, you probably should see yourself in David much more in his failures than in his conquests. So anyway, let's keep going. All right, so let's make sure we're playing the right part in the story. Right, so it jostles the spirit a little bit, but I want to show you one more verse because this one is going to help us get, golly, I'm just, I'm still in my intro. Um, people of the village are used to this. It's like, oh Lord, get comfortable. Uh, Ephesians 1, we're going to pick it up in verse 3. I want you to see this. Some scary words in here, but I'm going to try to help you not be afraid. Ephesians chapter 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now that's a spectacular verse. Every, all of them in the heavenly places. So, so let's make sure we see correctly. It's not that he's given me every material blessing. Right? Because again, doesn't Jesus clearly say, hey man, moths can eat that. Rust is going to get that. In fact, here, let, again, I love you enough. Look at me. Everything you own is the stuff of future garage sales, junkyards, and dumps. All right? Everything. <laughs> in fact, God drew me to Texas by moving my family and put me in next to a locker Come on. to a senior when I was not. And he started wooing me. And do you know why? It wasn't because I have crazy vocal folds, all right? It wasn't because I can yell. It wasn't because I was quick-witted, all right? That, that's not why he called me. According to this text, he had Jeff Faircloth proclaim the word of God to me and it captured my heart by the power of his Holy Spirit for the praise of his glorious grace. He didn't want Matt gloried in. He wants to be gloried in. And so he saved me. I'm curious if you guys think this 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 crowd is impacting his presentation. Zach, what do you think? Is the crowd is the crowd helping? Absolutely. I think the context of the whole situation, he's multiple <laughs> things happening, which is like one, he's delivering a message that is when as a viewer of Christian culture, you're kind of like, oh, it's kind of a burn on Stephen Furtick. Right. But also, the, the other aspect is that this audience that doesn't get really fiery, like, 
Bible driven sermons, yeah. like good exegesis of the scripture is also getting that. And so they're also getting shook. So there's like so many things happening that I think for sure he's like, I need to go into this city and I need to deliver a sermon that will change these people's lives forever. I think it's, uh, I think you're totally spot on. And I think he had this deep inside of him based probably on his prior interactions and some of the things he said in the elephant room. And so I think, I think it just kind of overflowed. The The funny part is though, is if you listen to this, there is a rhythm and a back and forth and a cadence with these sorts of crowds, which you're totally right, Zach. If you go in front of a crowd like this, that's excited for the word, and then you actually go exegesis through scriptures, they get fired up. I've been in these types of situations before. And when, when that happens, it, it, you could tell that there's this uh, kind of, he can't catch the cadence of the audience. Like there's almost this clun- yeah. clunkiness to like, what do I get, do I stop and let him, let him clap? And do I, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's like playing double dutch. <laughs> so you could kind of sense some of that just in the way they're responding and he doesn't know when to stop. So I think, I think it's fire. Some of you guys get really weird. I'm like, I don't want to lift my hands. I don't want to cheer on the pastor. I don't want to say amen in service. Listen, I'm, I'm not expecting everybody to be extra, but this is what I will say, and this is one thing that I do appreciate about churches like this. If you get more excited about the Super Bowl than you do about the preaching of God's word, I think that's a problem. Y'all be so turned down and so quiet and so reserved, but then I see you at the freaking basketball game. I see you watch, the, I go to the, the Super Bowl party and you turn all the way up at the Super Bowl, yelling at the TV, go, 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 ah! right? And then you're just like, just sitting like this during work. Like that, that's corny to me too. So anyway, let's, let's keep Yo, watching. If reformed preachers had ca- uh, uh, charismatic audiences, Come on, church bro. would be nuts. Come on. Church would be epic. That'd be like Sunday morning. That'd be like a UFC see fight every Sunday that'd be nuts it's like fire scripture experience the whole nine dude I would be I would be there for that for sure I would be there for that too all right let's keep let's keep going I want to tell you why it's such good news that God is for God over God being for you I'm not saying he's not for you I'm saying his motivation behind being for you is the sake of his own name Um, let me tell you why this is such good news since God is for himself over and above being for you, there are two huge pieces that we need to really get our soul around for the sake of our own joy, mm. right? Here's the first one. Come on. Since God is for God and God is ultimately about the praise of his glorious grace, look at me, God is not after my begrudging submission, mm. but after my joy. God is ferociously about my joy because the more I enjoy him, the more his grace is gloried in. So God wants me to enjoy him. And so look at me, because this is the one that throws people off. That's why he gives me the law. So we talk bad about the law in our day. We talk about the law and those Pharisees, those law doers. Mm. Listen, um, the law was delight. Didn't David lay on his bed and just delight singing about the law? Didn't he, didn't he say that? Didn't he stay awake late at night? Couldn't even sleep. He's just delighting in the law of the Lord. And I'll tell you why. Since God is for God and God is not after your begrudging submission, All the commands of God are meant to lead you into greater life and greater joy and to line you up with how he designed things to work rather than your way, which doesn't work. I don't want to like miss what he's saying here because it's so profound. What he's saying here is because God is about God's glory. If God is about God's glory and not your rule keeping, and then our job is to respond by enjoying God. The law becomes the guardrails for our flourishing, okay? So it's not that we do to get. It's not that I give money to get from God. It's not that I'm obedient to get a blessing from God. It's that I enjoy God, and therefore I am obedient, and, I, and, and my obedience is also for my own benefit. Right, it's, it's like creating guardrails for your children is in their best interest. And so I think oftentimes we get it backwards and we're trying to like earn our way to God. We're trying to uh, uh, rule keep for the sake of rule keeping. And, and, and that, that little bit is profound. I'm, I wanna pull that back because I wanna make sure that none of us miss this. Since God is for God and God is not after your begrudging submission, all the commands of God are meant to lead you into greater life and greater joy and to line you up with how he designed things to work rather than your way, which doesn't work. That, I mean, that's big. That's, that's big and it's simple, but it's big. Don't brush over this. The motivation changes. The application changes. So you're not just chasing God for a blessing. You're delighting in God and living his way.
And so when he does that with sex and he does that with money and he does that with rest and he does that, God's going, here's how I designed it to work. And greater life, John 10, 10, Come is on. found in your obedience to how I wired the universe to work rather than how you think the universe can work when he's already established that you're a bit of a, uh, forgive me, moron. <laughs> right? I mean, is anybody a worse enemy to you than you are? Has anyone lied to you more than you've lied to you? Anyone broken promises to you more than you've broken promises to you? Come no, on. you're the problem. Mm. And, and what we see is that God's law leads us into life. Now, you're not going to keep that law perfectly, which brings us to our second and biggest implication of God being about God. Come on. If God is about God, look right at me, then you are not the center of the universe. Now, breathe out. Breathe out. All right, can I, let me press a little bit. Almost all the conflict in your life is predicated and built upon your belief that the world's about you. The reason you get angry in traffic is because the world's about you. Get out of the left lane! <laughs> the, the reason why there's conflict in your marriage is because the world's about you, so your spouse had better be doing these things. Why? Because the world's about you. Why are you in conflict at work? Because the world's about you. How dare they say that to you? How dare they do that to you? How dare they take that from you? How dare they not give you the honor you're due? See, you see what's happening? It's about you. And the more the world's about you, the more angry and tired you'll be. And the more it's not about you, the more free you are. So listen, if, if, if ultimately when I come home, um, my marriage is about Jesus Christ and there's a grace there, there's a forgiveness there, there's a patience there, and there's a mercy there. If my marriage is not about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but rather it is about me, then there's expectation there. Isn't there? I mean, there's some things that better be done. I don't want to hear that woman. That, that's what happens if it's about me. It's about me. I start talking about my happiness and what I'm doing, what I'm owed. Or, or my wife does, but if it's about him, then I'm free. If my money's about him, then I'm free. If pastor in this church proclaiming the gospel is about him, then, then I'm free. So I don't, if I come into a place like elevation, it's just ridiculous, man. I mean, I just feel like since I landed, people like rubbing my shoulders and carrying my bags. And it's like, put me down. I can walk, right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. All right, but here's the thing. So, so if I could um, take this whole message and kind of just um, boil it down and condense it into its purest form. Here's simply what we're celebrating here. That despite me, despite my continued failures, despite my shortcomings and foolish heart, God, because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ to me and his wrath of absorbing death on the cross and his resurrection now sees me as perfect and spotless and holy and not because I am, but because he is, who owns the glory that everything is his. That's why no one should walk with a swagger in the kingdom and no one should walk with a limp. Yeah! We're his. <laughs> Sheesh! And so let me, let me tell you where I think we might be in a bit of a danger. You, you guys, and I'm speaking specifically now to Elevation, uh, you guys are in a bit of a place that the village has been, that's the church uh, I pastor, in that we, we just grew fast and, and we just tried stuff and we prayed a lot and fasted a lot and then just tried to roll things out. People just kept coming. We turned away weekend after weekend after weekend. We were doing six services at once in one little location and we're turning away from all six. And so we built a, you know, another building and just filled and then we had you know, we went multi-site and they filled. And, then, uh, and so he, here's what you need to be careful of. Don't, don't touch it. Keep your hands off it. Uh, there should be any um, chest beating in here. Mm, come on. Before you know it, just with a little shift here and a little drift there, God did these things and his name's still on it. But, but really, that Pastor Stephen, I mean, it was kind of his vision. It was kind of his deal. Boy, that lead team, you know, Chunk was lights out. I mean, that kid's just sick. And then all... I want... Oh, gosh, this... This didn't age well. Son, that worship band, we have the best worship in the world. We've got the, you know, and, and before long, you can weave these things into your culture and your ethos that are opposed to the things of God. And so when I pray for you and I pray for your pastor and I pray for these. Now, I don't understand when folks be like, prophecy ain't real. <laughs> because someone got a word for you and they're going to speak something, you don't have to. Tell them that it's a word and they're going to speak something. I think, I think Chandler, uh, I think he says a lot of things that came to pass, unfortunately. And, and, it, and, it, and it sucks to say that out loud. Place, this is where my prayers are, that God would protect you. Israel never did well with blessing. Never did well with blessing. 
There's a proverb that says an inheritance attained too early in life is not a blessing in the end. Growing too big too fast, earning too much money too fast, having a big, getting a big lump sum of money, like winning the lottery too fast, too soon, not a blessing in the end. That's why most professional athletes go broke. Do real well with a whack to the head. So I, I'd rather that not be your story. Now, if God wants to do it, let him do it. And, and there'll be joy even there. But, but hear me, yes, God loves you, but ultimately God is after the praise of his glorious grace. God is about God. So, so, but Christ has made a way. Our hope as believers in Christ is not in our embitterment, but rather in Christ's perfection. So you need to hear me say this to you right now. God is not in love with some future version of you. Amen. It's not you tomorrow that he loves and delights. It's not you when you get your act together. Listen, and if you believe that, you are an idolater. Sheesh. If you believe that Christ's love for you is a future love for you, then you dismiss the cross of Christ. Have you ever thought about the cross this way? Cross, the cross of Christ is this glaring acknowledgement that we're all screw-ups. Come on. This glaring acknowledgement that you're going to fall short, and I'm going to fall short, and I'm not going to measure up, and I'm never going to get to perfection like I need to get to perfection. And even if I could get to perfection, I'd have all that imperfection behind me. Then the cross go, yeah, I know. Then the cross say, yeah, I'm, I've made provision. And that's the beautiful part about the gospel, guys. When we grasp this, when you really grasp that compared to God's holiness, compared to God's expectations, compared to God's standards, none of us are righteous. So what that should do is that shouldn't reaffirm a evangelical Christian self-righteousness, I'm better than other people. It should humble us and break us and say, man, but for the grace of God, I could be in any of those, you know, precarious situations and, and lead us to live humble and, and get, and get this and lead us to live in a way where it's not us versus them. It's not us versus them. It's not the good guys versus the bad guys. They're, 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 we're just all bad guys. And there's one good guy, Jesus, and the people deemed righteous is not people who do right and do the things that are right, but are people who his righteousness is imputed on that choose to put with their faith in him. So I think, I think this, this idea, like the cross should really humble us, not in a way to, 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 to feel like we're better or to create some kind of goofy culture war or anything like that. It should humble us to say, wait a minute, man, w w w without, without Jesus, I'm pretty far gone, right? Without Jesus, I could have ended up in any of those types of situations. So I think that is such, so important for us to acknowledge. I think, and I think oftentimes we start walking with Jesus, we kind of get a rhythm, we start doing well, and then all of a sudden we think it's by our power that we're doing it. <laughs> and if we lose sight of the whole point, which is by grace through faith. Let's keep, man, okay, so why did I, why did I want to go over this? Okay, one, I wanted to highlight uh, Matt Chandler. For you guys, some of you guys don't know, uh, Matt Chandler, Village Church, mega church pastor. Okay, mega church pastor. So my uh, uh, critique is not about size of churches, one. Two, I wanted to show you guys a nostalgic time from about 10 years ago when I was really, I was on staff at my church at the time. I was really listening to a lot of Furtick. I was listening to a lot of Chandler. I was listening to a lot of Driscoll. I was, I was listening to a lot of stuff. And it was a different time. And these brothers would sit in a room together and they would have conversations together. And they would they would invite each other to, you know, Furtick invited him to his church. Like, how amazing is that? And then he invited some other guys to his church that were, you know, fa fairly solid back then. So um, I, w I wanted to show you guys that because I feel like, I feel like uh, the... The, the notion that a one a big church is bad is 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 not what I'm trying to say and I think that's nonsense okay two that um, elevation has always been doomed and gloomed and uh, I don't I don't believe that I don't believe that I think I think based on Chandler being to come with some clear concerns here and preach to them and have enough rapport with Furtick to come and Furtick having enough humility to bring out Chandler I think says a lot about this this time from 2012 and maybe some of the drift that happened afterwards, right? And it's unfortunate. And check this. And um, I, I'm still believing for a, a resurgence, a reflourishing of this level of humility, um, God willing, from the folks, uh, the leadership over at Elevation. Because it's not looking good right now. It really isn't looking good right now. Um, it's, 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 I mean... Based on Furtick's Instagram post last night where he turned the comments off, it's not looking good. 
where, 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 where the headspace is at. And the macro version of this is there's other Bible teachers. I don't agree with Matt Chandler on everything. I don't agree with every pastor about everything. However, um, I think he did a killer job on this. I think there's some very basic fundamentals that oftentimes we brush over. And when you brush over the fundamentals, you, you be out here looking goofy. There's a lot of guys that I play basketball with that are athletic, that think they could play basketball, but they haven't mastered the fundamentals. They don't know how to do a layup so that you jump off of your left leg and go up with your right hand when you do a layup. They, and so then you end up looking silly all over the court. And you can, and, and, and truthfully, hear me, hear me loud and clear. If you don't know the fundamentals, <laughs> if you don't know the fundamentals, you can hurt yourself. Like if you come out on the court and you think you know how the game works and you think you know you think how it all you, you have it all figured out because you played football and you got your athletic and you don't know the fundamentals of the game of basketball you could really hurt yourself you could get hurt you could mess around tear your ACL you could step wrong you could jump wrong right so I say all that is to say sometimes coming back to the good news and just going over the fundamentals of Good news, God creates the universe. It is good. Bad news, Genesis 3, things get bad. Man rebels. That is then passed on to us through the sin of Adam, right? And then this is this is over time amplified. And so God sends prophets. God gives his law. God, God does everything he could do. And we just keep rebelling. And God sends Jesus to live the perfect life that we could never live because we could never live up to the law, to die the death that we should have died because God is a holy God and you can't just come flippantly into the presence of God because you think you're a good person, right? You saw what happened with the tabernacle all throughout the book of Exodus, Leviticus, folks just being flippant with God. God's a holy God. The holy just means set apart, different out of this world. And so, and so God says, okay, I, I'm going to do it for you. You're incapable of doing it. I'm going to come. I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to live the life you couldn't live. I'm going to die to death. You should have died. Die on the cross. Take on the, the, the punishment for sin because a good judge has to punish crime and criminals. And then I'm going to restore humanity. I'm going to restore people back to myself so I could be in covenant with them. And they're not going to be able to keep all the rules, but that's what the cross is for. That's what the atonement is for. That is what it's all about. And, and, and not just that, but then he sends his Holy Spirit and we get to experience a piece of heaven on earth. So we don't just get to go to heaven eternity through his Holy Spirit. We can get aligned with his ways. And if we're in his ways and we're living our life his way, we can live his will for our lives. And that doesn't mean your happiness, as Matt Chandler said, but we can live his, his will, being in his perfect will isn't always going to be comfortable and cushy and nice, right? And how do we get to know his will through his ways? How do we get to know his ways through his word? And so a lot of us are, 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 are going off of, you know, just the, 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 the supplemental side of, of, of Christianity. You're not taking the time to get into his word, to learn his ways so you could be in his will. You're just kind of winging it. You're just kind of winging it. You're just like, ah, just right. It's, 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 it's not good. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like you're trying to, you're trying to get aligned with something and you want to see a breakthrough in your health and fitness. But instead of figuring out how to move more, how to properly track macros, how to properly eat, you just start taking a bunch of protein shakes. And that's what a lot of this stuff is. Just so we're clear. Okay, the meat and potatoes is you getting in the scripture for yourself, you getting into a local church for yourself, you growing and becoming dis a disciple and getting discipled yourself. All this other stuff is great. Christian music, Christian YouTube, your favorite preachers, Christian TikTok, all that stuff is great. But you can't, but, but it's but it's a supplement. A supplement. It's like creatine or protein. And a supplement is it can work. I drink a protein shake every day. It's good. You need, sometimes you just need, you need that protein release. You just worked out. You need that release. But if you are consumed with living your life off of supplements, you're not going, you're not going to be healthy. Okay. And that's my biggest concern with what I see in this landscape of, of Christian online Christianity, social media Christianity. This is a lot of people that are just Barely sustaining themselves off of supplements and not the gospel, not the good news, not understanding this, right? And it doesn't mean you need to stop listening to, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying use the supplement, but let the supplement be what it's intended to be. It's a supplement. This channel is a supplement. Your favorite Christian TikToker is a supplement. Protein shake. That's all that is. You got to get in the word for yourself. You got to get into a local church. You got to get into fasting. You got to get into praying. 
Can't just get these supplements. It's just oh, protein shake, oh, creatine, oh, amino acids, oh, and that's 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 not that's not how you grow. That's that's not how you grow. So. Hopefully this was helpful, man. Um, I'm grateful for everybody that's here. This video will get trimmed out, some of this stuff while I process. We do that to every video, by the way. Sometimes you guys are like, where's the video? What happened to the video? It's going to get trimmed down because um, we do that to all these because like an hour long is going to be a lot. Uh, we, I'm working on uh, some, some awesome interviews, so make sure you're subscribed. We're working on the director of The Elephant Room coming on. I, I can't reveal who it is, but you guys are actually familiar with some of his other work. I can't tell you just yet, but we're trying to lock that in and talking about some of the backstory of this era uh, of, of like Christianity and social media exploding at the same time and the fallout of, of post-Elephant Room, right, and, and the stuff that we're still dealing with. So that's coming up. Uh, if you guys want to partner with what we're doing here, the best way you can do that is through our Patreon community. It's 10 bucks a month. It's an easy way to get behind the mission of what we're doing here. And shout out to Sean Sean. He said, people want their ears tickled. They don't want to hear they are sinners. Some people are getting spiritually fat off of all the carbs. Come on. And not getting enough protein. I'm not good. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Amen. 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 And, 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 and I'm not good. I'm not, I, I, I need a savior. And, and let's, and let's, and let's, and let's add to that. Let's add to that. Yes. And and now I'm the righteousness of Christ because of what Jesus did on the cross. I'm no longer a sinner. I'm a saint because of what Jesus did on the cross. So I have to walk around with a subtle um, humility but confidence. That's, it's a dichotomy there. M my son is not afraid of me, but he knows I can end him. <laughs> my son is not afraid of me, but he knows I'm the father. Right. And so we play fight and we wrestle and we do stuff and I let him have fun. But that, but he has a confidence because he carries my DNA that 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 he can walk in this confidence. But rest assured, he knows I'm, subs I'm I'm substantially more powerful than him. And that's and that's the same thing in our pursuit of Christ. You need to have a, a, a humility of like, yes, I'm a sinner, but you also need to know that I'm an heir and I'm a child of God and I'm a saint and, 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 I, and I can walk into freedom because of the gospel. Right. So I, th I think it's an and both because because you could kind of slide into the self-deprecating. Oh, woe is me. I'm just a filth of the earth. I'm a scumbag. Right. You get and I've been there before. Right. And so but but it's an and both. It's an and both. Genesis 1, it was good. Genesis 3, it went bad. The gospel, Jesus comes back, deals with the sin, deals with it all. Right? So it's an and both. Guys, I love you guys so much. You guys have a good night, all right? Kingstream Entertainment. Bruce Lawn. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the video. If you check out the description of this video, you will notice that there are some free resources, including a free How to Study the Bible course and a free Master My Habits course I put together with my Christian therapist, Dr. Rudy, all about freedom forming habits. So check those out, the links in the description, and be sure to check out some of these other videos from me and YouTube recommended to you. All right, love you guys, peace.